All right, welcome to our kids' study. Let's look in 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. And what we saw last time is that you had Elijah. He was a great prophet of God. God did many miracles through him. The main miracle was that he showed Israel that God is the true God and not Baal because there was that contest where uh, the prophets of Baal, 450 prophets of Baal, called down fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice, and Baal didn't answer. Baal did not consume it. And then Elijah calls on God. He's the only prophet. Just Elijah by himself calls on God, and God consumes the sacrifice. And it shows Israel that God is the true God and not Baal. But Israel continued in their apostasy, meaning they continued to worship Baal and these false gods. And so then God says, basically, Elijah, you've done your ministry. So last time we saw that God took Elijah up into heaven. Uh, one of only two people, well, Jesus as well, uh, but uh, Enoch and Elijah uh, would be the only people who never died, that, they, uh, that God took them up into heaven without dying. And we saw that last time. And now there was another man, his name was Elisha, E-L-I-S-H-A, Elisha. And he's a, a, a prophet of God as well. And he had asked Elijah if he could have a double portion of the blessing. And he got that. And what that meant was, and we didn't go over it, but it means that Elijah, if you read the, the account of Elijah, it shows he did eight miracles in your Bible. And now we're on Elisha. And last time we already saw one miracle. And today we're going to see two more. Elisha, God did 16 miracles through Elisha. And 16 is double eight. Eight times two is 16. So Elisha did receive a double portion of the Spirit of the Lord that Elijah had. And so now we're going to see a couple of miracles here. Elisha now is going to be the prophet of God that's basically replacing Elijah. But God has already shown that Israel is uh, in unbelief. They're following other gods. And that's going to be important for us to understand these two miracles here at the beginning of Elisha's ministry. So we're in 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 19. 2 Kings 2, 19. It says, And the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord seeth, but the water is not, and the ground barren. Now, God had promised, we're going to look at Leviticus 26 uh, a little bit today. And again, I don't want to go into all that detail. You know, this isn't, we're not, this isn't a deep theological study here. Uh, we're just seeing what God does here. But he, basically it says the water is not and the ground barren. So what, you, what it's telling you is they have no water and no food or very little water, very little food. So they're saying, you know, everything's fine here, but except we can't eat, we can't drink. <laughs> you know, we, you know, you mentioned about how you just got rain there. He hadn't had it in 30 days. Well, they had had, under Elijah's ministry, they didn't have rain for three and a half years. So you can imagine how you're going to grow any crops or have any fruit or vegetables if you don't have any water for three and a half years. And so God's going to do a miracle here through Elisha. It says in verse 20, Elisha said, bring me a new cruise. A cruise is just basically a, a vessel that you have water in. Think of a pitcher of water. Bring me a new cruise and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. And he went forth unto the spring of the waters and cast the salt in there and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake. So uh, water, now they've got some good water, and the way they got it was by putting salt in there. He put salt in there. Now that seems kind of weird. I, I know if you say, if I want to get some water, uh, you know, say you, you want to get water here, you can dig a well, and you get the natural water. Well, I live about 45 minute drive from the ocean. There's a ton of water out there. But I'm not going to get the water out of there and try to drink it because it's got salt in it. So you need a fresh water supply, something without salt. 
in order to use that water. The water of the ocean really isn't good for that. I've heard in the Middle East, they've got, you know, when they have desert land, they don't have much water They're coming in the rain. They try to do what they, it's a desalinization plant, which basically means they've got, they spent millions of dollars on all this equipment to try to get the water from the ocean and to get the salt out of that so they can use it. So what I'd say it is you can use water, fresh water from a spring, but water like from an ocean that has salt in it, it's not good. You can't drink that. So then why is it? But yet here it is, the way they healed the water was by, was by putting salt in it. So in other words, normally that's not what you would do. Putting salt in it makes it worse. So how is it that the water is good because of salt? And the reason is because the salt is a sign. It is when you think of the water, the reason they don't have water and they don't have food is because they're serving other gods. And so God cut off that supply of the, of the good water and the food uh, produced by the ground. But in your Bible, you've got God is a type of the living water. There is in the Revelation 22, the last chapter in your Bible, it mentions that when you have God's throne, when God's throne is finally on earth, it says there's a river of water of life that proceeds from God's throne. And on either side of the river, there are trees and they produce fruit. So the point is, the reason God does that, it shows that life comes from God. You know, when we die, the only way that we're going to have eternal life in heaven is if we've trusted that God sent his son Jesus, that Jesus died, was buried, and rose from the dead to pay for our sins. So when we trust that Jesus died for our sins, then God gives us life in heaven. God is the one who gives life, or else we can't, we won't have life in heaven. And so God gives you, uh, showing that, because of the water that comes from his throne. Water represents life. You know, if I, I could go, you know, probably a few days without eating, and uh, it wouldn't be good, but I could survive. But if I go a few days and I don't drink any water or liquids, no liquids whatsoever, and I don't eat anything, so I don't eat anything or drink anything for three or four days, I'm going to be in a serious situation, serious problem. Um, water is the about the most uh, air is the most important thing you can't go about three minutes without air uh, and then number two is water you got to have air you got to have water and God designed it that way to show you that life comes from God so when God sets up his throne on the earth uh, uh, when God's kingdom comes then there is the throne of God and there's the river of water of life that comes from it and in John chapter 7 uh, Jesus talks about that in John chapter 7 when they were having a feast. Uh, Jesus says, on the last day of the feast, this is John 7, 37. John 7, 37, Jesus says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Now, he's not talking about, you know, that, oh, it's, 100 degrees outside and I'm thirsty, so give me a cup of water. He's talking about having life basically in God's kingdom when you die. Because he says in verse 38, that if he comes unto me and drinks, verse 38 says, he that believeth on me. So for us today, you trust that Jesus died for your sins. Then, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Again, this is talking spiritually. It doesn't mean you're going to be standing there and all this water is gushing out of your belly. But it's really talking about spiritually that life comes from God. The breath comes from God and the, the water that is talking about the spiritual water means that God is going to dwell in you. And uh, that's called the Holy Ghost because verse 39 explains that. Because you think that's weird that I would have rivers of living water coming from my belly. Well, verse 39 says, He spake this of the Spirit, which they that believe on Him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So basically he's saying, when he says you're going to have rivers of living water from your belly, what it means is that you're going to be, when, you've, when you die and you get to go to heaven, you're going to have the Holy Ghost within you. And He's going to be the one guiding you to do the things that God would want you to do. 
And so that's considered your life. Uh, life is, you know, about that. It's, it's basically showing you quality of life. A lot of times people think that, well, when I die, go to heaven, what am I going to do? You know, am I just going to sit on a cloud and play harp, uh, play the harp, or am I going to listen to music? I'm going to sing. What am I going to do? Well, what you're going to do is you're going to, God's going to live through you. He'll put his spirit within you and he will be the one guiding you there in heaven. And so you'll be sharing his love with everybody, which is a lot more exciting than just sitting on a cloud and playing a harp. Uh, you get to do what God wants you to do. And that, in spiritual terms, is considered the living water. And so that's what's going on here in 2 Kings 2. When he says, put the salt in there uh, and heal the waters. It's showing, spiritually speaking, you're serving Baal and you're serving Ashtaroth. You're serving these false gods. And these false gods, they can't give you life in heaven when you die. So he says, you come to me. And for us, you trust that Jesus died for your sins. So then when you die, you'll get to go to heaven and you'll have eternal life. And the salt there is a, is a type that in addition to needing water, and I know salt water in the ocean, we can't drink that, but we also need salt in our bodies for it to, to function as well. And salt, we naturally get that in a lot of food, especially today. In America they put salt in everything so you got plenty of salt you don't have to go and take salt you got that in your food and Jesus said uh, in Matthew chapter 7 I think it is um, in Matthew chapter 5 Matthew chapter 5 he told his disciples in verse 13 and Matthew 5 13 he told his disciples that ye are the salt of the earth so what's going on here with this miracle is it showing you got waters that you can't drink. And so then because uh, the salt is a representation of the gospel given out. And so for us today, the way we get that, we trust that Jesus died for our sins. And then when you do that, then the waters are healed like it is here when he put the salt on that. And that's really showing that you get eternal life in heaven. So basically this really did happen. It's a miracle because if I took salt and put it on bad water, it only make it worse. It's not going to clean it up where you can drink it. But God has salt there as a type of the gospel, and He has the clean water as a type of getting life in heaven once you believe that gospel. And then the final thing, we're almost out of time, but the final miracle here in chapter 2 is in 2 Kings 2, 23. It says, He went up from thence unto Bethel, and as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children out of the city and mocked him and said unto him, Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. So in other words, they're making fun of him because he doesn't have any hair. And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood and tear forty and two children of them. So there were forty-two children that were killed by these bears, the ones that mocked the prophet. And you think, well, that's pretty cruel that, you know, just because you call them baldy, you know, that he didn't have any hair, that you'd have 42 kids killed just for mocking him. That's pretty cruel. Well, what it's showing is that it shows they're not following the ways of the Lord. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing for adults to curse God and not believe God. But when children don't believe, that's really bad because all of us, as a child, we know that God has created us and we know that there's right and the wrong and we all know that we're not perfect and we all know that we've done some bad things and so that Jesus died to pay for those bad things and give us life in heaven. Uh, that's really easy for people to understand because God's shown you inside that God created this world. Uh, and, and so when kids mock the things of God, then it shows how bad society is. And the reason this happens, it's a sign to Israel. And I don't want to go into all the details, but in Leviticus 26, God tells them that if you don't serve me, I'm going to punish you. And then you get another chance to serve me. If you don't serve me, then I'll punish you again. And it's just like when you're a child there, uh, when your parents punish you, it's at, really out of love because you've done some things that you shouldn't do and so they punish you 
because they love you, because they know that if they get you to do what you should do, then when you get to be an adult, then uh, you won't get punished by society. Because society, people out there, they don't care about you when you're an adult. If you break the law, you end up going to prison. And they don't treat you nice there. So your parents give you rules, not because they're being mean, but because they love you. And they want you to understand you got to live by certain rules. And when you do, then everything will be okay. If you don't, you end up getting punished because they want you to know these things are important. And so God was doing the same thing with Israel. He would punish them if they didn't obey. And here they are. God showed clearly that He is the true God, and yet they won't serve Him. And so one of the punishments you can see in Leviticus 26 and verse 21, He says, If you walk contrary unto Me and will not hearken unto Me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle and make you few in number and your highway shall be desolate. So the reason that these uh, children were killed by these bears uh, is because Israel continues to reject God. And because he loves Israel and wants him, them to serve him, then he brings this punishment on them so that they'll recognize he is the true God. So that's, that's what's going on there. There was a prophecy. And so if they read their Bibles, they'd say, oh, well, this shows us how we are going against God and we need to serve him and not Baal. So that's why that's there. It's, you know, people look at it and say, you know, what's sure that children shouldn't have mocked the prophet of God, but why do they get killed for it? Well, it's not just that thing. It's because Israel as a whole is serving these other gods and they won't recognize God. And God loves them. He says, I don't want you ending up in hell. I want you to have life with me forever. And so I'm going to push you in that direction by sending you punishments to show you that you need to get back in line and serve me. So let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son to die on a cross for our sins. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to read your Bible and follow what it says uh, so that we can show your love to others. In Jesus' name, amen.